Hi, my name is Benedict. This is part four, if I'm correct, in the, the series on building and using SANS. I know this is very synth based, but this is still great information for anybody, whether you're a guitarist or a fiddle player or, or whatever, anybody who's creating mixes, who's writing music. Uh, this is actually useful information and actually core information. It's more important than where to put your filter knob or whatever, not as apparently sexy. So I do encourage you to take the time, as the tag says on the other way, beginning the thinking guide. This is the thinking behind why the producer that you like does the things he does. It's very easy and very fashionable to say, oh, I just want to do those things. But the reason he does those things is because of. And just going, I'll, I'll put the knob there or I'll compress it this way is not going to teach you when to apply that form of compression, when to not apply compression. You're just going to whack that same thing on everything. Which you may think, oh, if I apply all the pro techniques at once, then I'll be the most pro dude in the game. I'm sorry, but you won't. The whole trick is that there are no tricks. Oh, all those tips and tricks you learned useless. No, they're not useless. It's just that you need to know when to use them. Otherwise, it is as ridiculous, as I, as I put in one of my recent um, written posts, it's somewhat as ridiculous as hiring in Kenny Rogers to sing out front of Metallica. Kenny's a hell of a singer, a wonderful singer. There's no one quite like him. But if we jammed him into James Hetfield's role, forgetting that James plays guitar, but if he jammed him into James Hetfield's role, would Kenny Rogers work? He's a great singer. It's got a massive fan base, decades worth of fan base. Is that Metallica with Kenny Rogers out front record going to sell well? I pretty well guarantee you it'll be lucky to sell one or two copies. I'd give it a listen. I really would, because I like Kenny and I admire Metallica. So it's just entirely possible that they come up with some magic. But look at what happened when we put Metallica and Lou Reed together. Did they come up with magic? Not so convinced on that one. So, sounds. We've gone through bass sounds. Things that play in the bass register underpin the musical and melodic structure. That is what they do. If they don't do that, if they lead, then they're a lead sound. They're at the front, they're setting up what's happening musically. And by musically, I'm hoping that we mean... Notes put together in a thoughtful fashion. Is not really notes put together in a thoughtful fashion. Even if you go... not really in a thoughtful fashion. You get away with it, but <laughs> trouble is everybody's doing the same thing. So, leads. In the middle we've got polyphonic sounds. Polyphonic sounds are those that play, commonly play chordal or multi-voice things. A polyphonic sound can actually be playing lead in your mix. Not at all unusual for piano which is a polyphonic sound, to be playing the lead in your mix. If you like Coldplay, personally I'm not such a fan, but if you like Coldplay, then you're used to a piano as being a lead in a mix. A guitar. So long as we're not talking about the guy who just incessantly strums, uh, a guitar in a mix is a polyphonic instrument, and it can be playing the lead, or it can be playing the background, or it can swap from background to lead to background. Slash being obviously the most obvious answer to that because he goes from playing riffs to back to riffs that's cool the polyphonic sounds sort of sit in the middle they're a bit of both and now we come to what's essentially the last main style of musical sounds that you deal with these are called pads pads are 
basically named because this is what everything sits on. And you might think, yeah, but Benedict, everything sits on the base. It does. But what if you want something to fill between the base and the lead? If this is what we've got going on, we've got that left empty. Now, that could be exactly what your piece needs. And if it is, don't fill it up. Just don't. Or if you do, do it very subtly. But if you're looking for more of a solid mix, then that commonly means filling up those areas with something. But don't just fill it up to say, oh, look, I'm going to jam the biggest mofo of a block chord, or a hammer chord, as that might be, to make a full sound. It just means that this isn't engaging, this isn't engaging, and together they just still aren't engaging. It means that there's something wrong with your composition. If this was my whole composition... And I did that for three and a half minutes. It's either a really edgy piece, or it's just shit, because it wasn't written out properly. In the middle, we might choose to do... We've now created counter melody melodic movement, even though we're just doing this. See, so it gives you opportunity to create more emotional engagement. Forget making your sounds this huge. Every idiot does it. Every idiot's losing with it. Look to make your sounds emotionally huge. Grab the listener here in the imaginations, in the feelies, and make them go, fuck me, isn't this amazing? It's changing my life. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Metallica's Into Sandman, Exit Life, or Kenny Rogers. Thinking about Lucille or The Coward of the County or any of those things. Grab people in the feelings, and then it's going to seem huge, and the rest's easy. So, pads. If we were to be playing everything on, let's say, a piano, we had a piano reduction of our piece of music we would have, let's start with our same piece of music. That. This is the pad part. It also actually corresponds to the bass part, which sometimes is the case. And if you've got a simple mix with not a lot going on, then yes, by all means, the two can echo each other. The lead part is the higher part. But if when, we, when we start to make a slightly more complex piece of music, which really I do hope you do, then we can have situations like this. So we've taken that very simple figure, it's just two notes in our pad, that's filling out the sound, what the acoustic guitar tries to do when he's strum, 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 and then we've added or whatever it was I played on top, we've added an actual melody to keep this interesting and engaging. So your pad's the bit that sits in the middle. This bit, the, which has probably brought you to realizing one of the problems we've got here. The fact that I'm playing the same instrument for the, the pad section of the arrangement and the melodic or lead section of the arrangement, we've developed some serious mixing problems because we are just having a gob of sound, which is a problem that you have when people don't realize and they just strum to get the hugest sound that they can get which is why acoustic guitars on recordings commonly use what's called the Nashville tuning, which is taking the, um, the, the thinner strings, the higher strings from a six string guitar, fitting, sorry, for a 12 string guitar, fitting them to a six string guitar, which means they're basically playing an octave up. So when you listen to Dwight Yoakam doing his strummy bit, it sounds almost more like a hi-hat line, 
because they're getting that out of the way, they're actually moving his pad part up here to stop that. So there's a good cool trick for you if you are working with guitars and you're just like, oh my god, this thing is just gobs of bleh in in the mids. Restring that guy, or if you can't restring him, then simply use your EQ wisely. In other words, you're going to take a doozy of a high pass filter, so you're just going to lop off everything. Possibly below middle C, wherever is right. You're going to boost the high end of that guitar so that you get the bright going across strings more than the body of it. And then suddenly you'll find that you can fit in your other instruments around it, your pianos, your synths, all the other stuff will actually start to fit in because you've lightened your pad. This will come back in later. So we start with here with a sound. We should go, oh, this is just a string sound. So you're back to lead sounds again, Benedict. Here is your difference. A string sound is commonly used as a pad. This is what people will do to their lead sounds. And I talked about this last time. I warned against it. They'll go. I can add in all this extra thickening stuff to make it sound huge. Sounds real pretty. Definitely does. And it's not that that couldn't or shouldn't go in a mix but you've now pulled that sound backwards because of all the extra guff that you've painted on it. So if we were to be doing... It's changed what we're doing. And that could be good if that's exactly what you need in a role but decide where that goes. What I've just played there and the way that it comes across because of all the processing that we've got on it is making that whole section almost more of a pad. Even though it's got elements of a lead, mix-wise it's starting to become more of a pad. Now you might take that line I've just got there and then add in a lead sound. So a clarinet or an oboe or something might well be doing a On top of that, you've now got two layers of melody. That's really engaging, because we've got the lower stuff, the middle stuff, which was a lot slower than that, and the elements here. So pads are about the middle of your mix. It's very tempting, and I did this tremendously when I was younger, tremendously, to build the whole piece out of pads. Start out by going... It's got no movement. It's a hell of a sound. It's a stonker of a sound, especially when you've done that, but you've got no movement. So make sure you remember what roles an instrument's playing. The other concern that I see a lot of is that people will then add that octave below. So it's right nicely in the middle of where pads belong. Let's add in an octave below. Sounds really great, but the problem is you're going to struggle to mix that. Just like that guitar where the guy's playing great big gobs of chord, thank you Russell Bush of the third. Uh, with those great big gobs of chord, you're just creating a lump of low mids, which is what we've got here. If there's not much else going on, brilliant. But if you're just going in solo, ooh, this sounds great, it's big. It is, but how are you going to mix it? Better to 
have this and if you need more in the oomph down below we'll have even just playing a single note not playing the whole lot an octave below so that would be um, that's two octaves below um, if it's an octave below it has great on its own but you've got some problems so far better that you're playing your chord Here how that single, just taking the root of the chord initially, then allowed me to start to add in a little bit of figure around it. Suddenly we've got an extra layer of movement in our mix. Wow, that's really cool. That we've added something where you may not have expected it, especially if your audience isn't used to it. Uh, speaking of gunners, sweet child of mine, that extra little bass thing that comes in, I don't know whose line that is, but that's just bloody brilliant. Rock songs don't do that, and yet it did. Just like it suddenly played sort of backwards. I don't know whether that was the bass player's idea, whether it was a producer's player, I don't care. It helped make that song. When that when I first listened to the song, I'm going, oh, that's rather cool. So this whole thing, right? But then suddenly there's this bit where the bass plays this sort of almost backwards figure based on the rest of the song. It's like, geez, that got my attention. And I think it got lots of people's attention. They couldn't necessarily note it as to what it was, but that was a cool bit. So rather than automatically saying, I'm going to dump something an octave below so that it sounds super fat, don't be lazy. Play your chord. And either the same sound, or this is a great opportunity to have a different sound, start with just playing the root of that and an octave or two octaves down, not enough to muddy up your bass, but then it allows you to create a little bit of movement there as well as up here. Musically, it's going to change what you do. And you might say, oh, but they're classical music techniques, and that's for losers. Remember what I just said about Gunner's Sweet Child of Mine? They took that technique just listening to the best of the Beach Boys in the car yesterday. And a lot of what they did there is not a million miles away from classical, or probably a little bit more Baroque technique. And people still say how brilliant it is. He just borrowed some of what he knew about classical or Baroque technique. Nothing wrong with that, because there's nothing wrong with Beach Boys songs. So pads, you can make them up out of quite simple sounds, quite simple. Quite simple indeed. You can add little bits of, um, little bits of drive to them. really wave shaping there but... but be careful how much you do you can already hear that starting to, to crackle and that's going to make that sound a lot harder to mix a pad is generally not there to lead the mix it's to fill the mix and by mix please don't again go back to thinking oh it's all technical i just need to have something in every single part of the keyboard or whatever no 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 that's following tips and tricks rather than following what your song needs if you realize oh i can add some power by bringing strings in here look at what metallica did they did it with the song i don't think they were too impressed when bob rock says it i mean man your name's brock it's not classical, not classical, it's Bob Rock. But that pushed black a lot further than it would have otherwise gone because he added strings. 
that was pads. They added some melodic elements, but they were primarily a plaid role. So you can use simple sounds, be careful of how much you drive or complexify them. We'll get into the other side of that later. I know you want to talk about interesting things. But watch how bright they are. That as a pad is going to be problematic in a mix because you've got a lot happening up in the top register there. Here, let me turn it on. I know you really like seeing this thing. Master section. What I'm circling there is really where your leads need to be coming to life. And if you've got vocals, which are a lead, they're just a lead instrument. They're just a pretty darn complex one because they've managed to spit out words. But they're just leads. That's where they need to have dominance. Even though you might go, but Benedict, I don't sing up at 5.1 kilohertz. <laughs> Probably just as well. But in the mix, that's what we call air. And if you've got dominance in the air frequencies, you've got dominance in the mix. So don't fill your pads out so that they are all the way up there unless they step into a lead role if i want this to be this bright excuse me whilst i find an eq this fella will do the job hear how they're still there and I've carved a bit of a hole for them. So it's not uncommon for strings, high strings, to be this bright. Sounds great, but you're actually going to have some difficulties when you mix it, especially if you've started out by doing this when you've soloed your sound. Ooh, all that lovely air. Problem is, when you come to mix it, you're going to have difficulties. If you handle it right, will work better. Even though you think, but you don't have that bright sound. Remember, once you're in a mix, all the instruments have to work together not just one on his own. One on his own is easy, any idiot can mix that. Boost the treble, boost the bass, throw it out the door. They all have to work together, so whatever is lead, let that have the most air. Whatever's gonna sit as a pad, even if we've got a really high pad, you'll find that it often makes sense to start to roll some off. Even if it means creating a boost just a little bit lower down. Deal with that if and when you get there. The other thing that people will try to do is create these immensely broad sounds. Let's just get our volume back up. Now it's a great sound, don't get me wrong, it really is a great sound despite the fact that it's a wee bit done to death. It's a great sound. But remember, the fatter you make a sound, both this way in terms of how much detuning it's got, unison, detune, this, that and the other, and width, the less defined that sound becomes. Now, the great thing is with pads, they can be quite ill-defined. That's their role, to sit in the back, in which case you really can fatten them out. But take care that you don't fatten them up so much like this when they're soloed. And I, I try to never work with soloed instruments. You know, I'll create my sound, but I'm creating it as part of a mix, not as part of a, this is the coolest sound ever, now let's try and jam it in somewhere, which is trouble. You know, it's, it's just like 
forcing people to live with each other like their family, even though they've got nothing in common. It's only a matter of time before you've got dented pots, pans and heads. So think, what does the role got to be? This can have a role in the mix, but bear in mind that its hugeness in every direction means that other things can't be as huge as it. Otherwise, if we put... Well, let's borrow from an ad that used to be on telly here from, from Mitsubishi, their, their um, Fuso range of trucks, mm, not so squeezy. They got three sumo wrestlers and whacked them in the front of this small truck to say to drivers, hey, there's more space in here than you're used to in a truck. In terms of mixes, what we've got here is a sumo wrestler of a sound. Especially once we're playing chords with it. If you want to make every sound in your mix like a sumo wrestler, you've got to be very careful. So why not say, I'm going to feature one or two sounds as sumo wrestlers, and the other ones I'm going to be like little ninjas. They're going to run around the, the sumo wrestlers and do their job as ninjury jobs rather than sumo jobs. So absolutely no race or anything intended there, merely just an easy way of saying one's big, the other small and manoeuvrable. So big and slow, smaller and manoeuvrable. So pads commonly are big and slow, but just don't have too many of them and don't let them get in the way. So another thing that we commonly do is if we add, I'll do it here. High pass filter, which I spoke about before. Bearing in mind you've got bass instruments in the mix, taking up lots of welly, oomphiness, if you start to add a whole pile of that with your pads, that can often sound bigger. Another trick, because you can have, sorry, because you can have more of it, you can actually push this ladder without filling the mix with all this stuff. You can chop some of it off. Therefore, letting you push that sound further forward, if you want, if you need. I'm not saying you should do that automatically, but you can do. So that's going to allow us to have other instruments in the mix and still seem fairly big. Here's another trick that I learned. It took me a long time to learn this, but it's self-evident once you get it. You sort of think, okay, that sounds really big. But seeing you've got to cut some of this off, it doesn't, it doesn't sound so big. And you want it to sound really big, but for some reason it kind of doesn't. Not there. Different sound, but that's actually bigger. You've got to find it within your own piece and what your composition is. You think the attack's going to make it sound bigger. It doesn't. Makes it sound more detailed, which makes it seem more intricate. So take some of the attack off, because remember cellos, double basses speak a lot slower than do little fiddles they speak slower so you can give the illusion that this sound is bigger by making it speak slower you see there as I've really slowed it down right into pad territory it's slow and ponderous, which makes it big. Clever trick. I won't teach you that one. So it's about knowing purpose. So Commonly we'll go for big sounds, and that's quite okay. Be cautious about trying to add an extra bass, but you see what I've done here. If I drop an octave here,
is giving me some of the advantages of dropping that octave without adding the bass merc. So there's a way to do it. But like with anything, there's a trade-off. Do you want your car to be pin sharp and be able to go around corners at ridiculous speeds? Or do you want your car to be comfortable? Do not pretend that you're going to have both. If you're driving a Camry, you've chosen a comfortable car. Don't push your own corners too fast. If you're driving a Porsche, don't pretend it's ever going to be comfortable. Two different things. Choose which you want. People will pretend to tell you you're getting both, but it's best to assume you're buying a Camry or you're buying a Porsche. With your song, this sound is a Porsche or it's a Camry sound. Over time, you may find ways to bring them a little closer together, but as long as you're trying to make it everything at once, it's a Porsche and a Camry at once. Come on, get real. You're going to struggle with that. Allow each to take its role. Have another instrument play the role of the other thing, which is why the market has things called Porsches and Lotuses and what have you, and things called Camrys and Maximas and what have you, because they serve different purposes. Allow your sounds to serve different purposes. If you really were a driver who wanted both of those, you'd have a Camry as your, your drive car for the, for the week, and you'd buy yourself a Porsche for the weekend. Because you know you're never going to get the both in the one car. So that allows you to have the advantage of the different the different overtone series. Remember, oh, turn both off. There's our overtone series there. There's our overtone series there. They're both the same type of oscillator if we move them to a different oscillator. We get a different sound. Probably a little easier to hear if we go back to single oscillators. Never be afraid to use them. Now, as you'll see, I already have this set up so that we've got pulse width modulation. Sorry, was touching my face because I'm really sweating in here. It's incredibly hot today, even though I've got a door open. So it's a beautiful sound that's going to sit nicely in the middle of the mix. If you want to richen it up, by all means, drop an octave. Two octaves is probably unwise, but do whatever the, the mix needs. Not what you want, but the mix needs. Again, I would rather... Give myself the flexibility of being in control. You know, I see so many people that grab a, an orchestral plug in and they just move the whole orchestra. Yeah, it sounds impressive, but you've got no control. Whereas if you separate each of those parts out, violins one's doing this, violins two's doing that, cellos are doing that, your, your, um, your basses are doing the other then you've suddenly got a lot of control and you're building in all that texture rather than just saying everything's playing all the same notes at once because orchestras don't do that. And it's why you, one reason why you can often pick MIDI orchestras because it's just like, oh God, this, play, this guy's whacked down a whole pile of chords on an orchestra pre preset. So don't be afraid to break your sounds up. And we can then add in a bass sound down here. more interesting. Now the other type of sounds that you're going to hear a lot of in pads and become super popular and with very good reason is your digital synth type instrument. Europa being a wonderful example of such a device. That gives a little bit more space. Actually we'll just get rid of the whole thing. Europa. Focus. There we go.
these sorts of sounds are very attractive to want to put in a mix. Very, very attractive. Uh, I've made this sound. Um, that's similar to what we had before. It's a string sound, but there's so much around it that I've declared it to be a pad. What you'll see with all of these is a lot of movement. If you are one of those people, I think I'd be swapping that reverb for a nicer one. Uh, if you are one of those people that wants to rely on this one or two monster sounds that has huge amount of movement in it, by all means, but please understand that Subtlety is the key. That has a fair bit of movement in it, and I'm real proud of this sound. And somebody's going to be asking how do you do it, the trick's up here. So I've created a filter shape. So this is essentially a filter, not any different really from this filter. But it's working in, in, a, in a more op, more sort of spectral way because this is an additive synth of heart. So it's taking all of these overtones and it's turning them on and off. You can see actually see them jump. Like this little fellow's jumping, like he's dancing. That's this. And this is moving fairly slowly. So one overtone or partial is switched off, switched on, switched off. And so it's that sudden movement that gives you the blocky tinkly sort of a sound there's a trick for you but these complex sounds be careful when you use them think when you use them don't just go oh wow that's a stunning sound i'm gonna whack it in here uh what role does it play what does it add in um, bon jovi uh, i was on off slippery when wet um, 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 um. Uh, ride this cowboy when I ride for this six gun by my side. Anyway, the the the, the ballady song on there. Um, that's got a fairly textured synth sound in it, but it adds value to especially the beginning of that song. Um, use this subtly. Allow that movement to build, not to dominate. There are times where you may use it as as something of an intro. you've got to add something else to that you've got to sculpture that sound that you're making melodically and i know for those of you who are drone artists or whatever that's fine break as many rules as you want but if you're just having one wash of noise after another which people do with pads drones are just pads what are you building where are you taking the listener even if you're just thinking, well, I want them to have this nice floaty space where they sort of get all new agey and relaxed or feel really, you know, um, then that's okay. But build a sense of movement and narrative in with it. So if you're using a complex pad sound that's got lots of things going on, building a narrative. That's one of those really bright ones. Classic sort of D50 type stuff. And you'll often hear people define a pad sound by a particular synth. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just that's a kind of sound that became known with that particular instrument. Roland's D50, and then to some extent, Korg's wave stations made these kinds of sounds. So if you're in a situation and someone says to you, oh yeah, I'm after that sort of D50 type sound, then it gives you a sense of, I'm looking for that kind of thing. Classic digital sound. Mm -hmm. 
So you've got a lot of options there, but be careful, because remember, that's an immense sound. It sounds great on its own. I'm delighted with it. You know, that's why I've saved it off. I think, wow, how cool is that? So by using features of the sound, I'm now able to give it some narrative. I've taken and turned it into that. So find ways to make movement. Repetitive movement's very fashionable. Everything's tied to a BPM. Very fashionable. But my advice is be careful. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it really is a good thing to have things tied to a BPM, but you're actually better off not having them tied to a BPM, or if you are, have several ties which are outside of your basic BPM. So what I mean there is, if your basic bass line is 16ths, which so often we do, <laughs> and then you've created a pad sound that has a, a movement and that tinkle's happening on sixteenths as well. Guess what? Everything's sitting on sixteenths. Move that tinkle. Move it off to eighth triplets. Put it in the middle somewhere. My personal advice is turn the BPM thing off. So what I mean here is if you've got beat sync on an LFO or on some kind of an envelope, turn it off. Because in the real world, everything moves to its own rhythm. Collectively, they create this really cool polyrhythm, but everything moves to their own rhythm. If you've put everything to exactly the same rhythm, yes, it's nice when your band plays in time. But you know what's nicer? When you've got a band that plays slightly out of time. I'm not talking about the drunk idiots down the pub who can't play in time at all. I'm talking about when we're looking at Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, um, it, real high quality acts. Um, the Ace and the Whole Band behind George Strait. God, those guys are brilliant. Um, as is the E Street Band. Brilliant. Are they all playing perfectly in time? Bloody hell no. They're too good for that. So there's a natural movement. So by putting things to a free sound, you'll find that everything moves and it moves more organically. And you can move that and you may find that you get close to the BPM, but not being on the BPM is far better than just locking everything down. You can say, oh, I lock everything down, everything's done. No, you're going to lose a lot of organic movement and that excitement of things being slightly outside of where they are. That's why the E Street Band and the Ace and the Hole Band were so damn good, because they know where the beat is and they know where to not be on it. Which, unfortunately, the drunk idiots down the pub, they don't know where the beat is and they're always trying to be on it. That's why they're so terrible. So, that's another bit of advice. Obviously, same technique going on here. Interesting sound. But when you use sounds like this, decide what role they're playing. Are they playing a musical role? In which case, that's our pad, and we've got our melodic stuff, whether that's guitars or strings or, or synth leads, whatever, moving around that. Or are they actually playing a sound effect role? Sound effects I love, but you've got to plan them as well. Sound effects is half of what this is, and it's the bit that makes it interesting. Let's see if we can find it. There we go. This is the pad. It's a nice sound, it sits in the mix just fine. But this is what really makes it interesting. So allow it to also play the role of a sound effect, in which case 
if I were pulling that sand in, I'm probably not going to pull it in in a melodic section. No, not a highly melodic section. I'm not going to want it to fight with my um, with my conversation between my cello and my clarinet's sounds. Because it's probably a bad idea. Doesn't mean I can't or wouldn't do it, but it's probably a bad idea to fight. But if I'm wanting, if I've had that little bit of a between these two sounds, they've had their, their, their run, and I want to have a little bit of space, a bit of breather between, that's where I might introduce one of those. So I might just carry some of the chords, or even move from, you know, let's say I was here when I finished, and I want to get to here, And then start back up again with my next sounds there. So in, in essence, it's a sound effect palette cleanser as it passes through. Another thing that you can do with pads. Self-evident what that thing is. Good luck with using that in the middle of a mix. I don't advise it. If it's a melodic mix, you probably don't want to do this. But for an intro or a spacer or an end, that's so arresting. Especially if we're adding in an extra layer. Wow! And you know how I know that's really arresting? Billy Idols, eyes without a face. If you don't know it, stop pretending to be a musician, go out YouTube it. Eyes without a face by Billy Idol. That intro sound, which is not a million miles from this. Boy, does that build this tremendous mystery around this piece. And by the way, the backing is Les Yeux Sans Visage, which is French for eyes without a face. Gary Newman's type strings. Now these are the kinds of pads that's very easy to pass over. If you're going through and auditioning a sound set, which is essentially what I'm doing right here to show you different types of pads and talk about what you might use them for, this is the kind of pad that people will pass over. It doesn't sound like a spaceship. It sounds like a wasp in a jam jar, especially in these ghastly things. But this is going to sit in a mix really nicely. In the right place and the right mix it's got that little nasal sound which means that you find where that sits in your mix and it's going to sit in there really nicely because you've got lots of space for all your other things to go on around it you probably are going to eq that and on its own it's probably going to sound even worse but that's good because you don't listen to this sound on its own it's part of a mix when you listen to the beatles or whatever anything you're not listening to one sound. You might think you are. You might be focusing on that sound at the front that's really blamming. Makes you want to take your pants off and run around. In actual fact, you're listening to the whole mix. So don't put aside sounds like that that go, oh, that's a bit nasty. Yeah, it is. Great, great records. You pull out the individual sounds, they often sound nasty. Really nice broad digital pad so that that you could put on an in your record you can put almost anything you can even put it in modern country it's it's just going to sit innocuously in the middle that digital thing means that you can use it to offset other more organic sounding instruments some of the best best 
pure electronic music was written with real bass players and real drummers. And I know we think, oh, the best electronic music is written with drum machines and bass line machines. No, some of the real best stuff was written with real bass players and real drummers. It's that contrast. And I'm not talking about some kind of weird modern hipster idea of electro, let's jam some of you in our lame rock record and, and pretend to be electro. That's just crappy work anyway. It's that contrast. So while we can all tend to be obsessed with saying, I want every single instrument to sound like it came off of an MS-20 from 1979, yeah, cool, I get that, I really do. I spent decades doing it. If you feature some MS-20 sounds around this, the digitaliness of this is really gonna highlight the MS-20-nessness of that other sound. Whereas if every single sound in that mix sounds like an MS-20, we don't have as much to contrast it with, especially if your whole record sounds like an MS-20. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't write the definitive MS-20 does whatever record, but if you're wanting your mixes to seem more interesting overall, broader overall, then look at contrast. So contrast can be having quite an electronic record, Gary Newman, John Fox. John Fox is Metamatic. That album's largely um, got, I believe it's a real bass player as part of what sets that off. Really electronic records, like real. It's the, it's the poster child for a, a brilliant electro record. I think it's pretty well all um, real bass. And might be some drums, I can't remember. But nonetheless, the contrast with having the real instrument and of course his singing, even though it's somewhat deadpan and electronic, makes is part of what makes that record work. Plus the very, very clever use of simple harmony. Everything's moving all the time. Brilliant record. You've got to listen to that. So my point here is that while that may sound like, oh, it's such a cliched sound, Benedict, why would we do that? That's going to sit very beautifully in a mix because it doesn't massively draw attention to itself and it will contrast with everything around it. Plus it's familiar. That's a kind of sound that we've heard a lot of and so it's nice and familiar. That's more of the same. Ooh, I love that. I'm glad this is here. This is very typical of a certain style of pad. So we see we've got a flanger. Sound itself isn't doing an awful lot. You can use flanges and phasers. To add movement. Choruses do too but it's not the same as having a phaser or a flanger. Just be aware, very easy to fall in love with that sound. Clearly I did because I saved it. And I've learned over the years that that kind of sound, it's picking out frequencies as, as it scans through them and makes them go, whoa. They can be tricky in the mix, often so much that, that you've got to compress them quite heavily or even just limit them. Just say, there you go, there's a brick wall, throw yourself at it. Uh, that's something that you kind of have to be fairly forward about doing with them. But understand that it also kills some of the dynamics and the movements. It's the frequency sticking themselves out that makes that sound really cool. So if you wanted to have that full dynamics, which is all the air inside that sound, then don't put too much around it. If you're using that sound, there's a fair chance you're wanting to show that sound off. In which case, go very carefully. I would 
perhaps put a um, a peak brick wall up it, up against it, but not to see much activity happening here. I'd ideally want to see none, but just to make sure that it isn't going to have a moment where a few frequencies come together and <laughs> ugly. Um, although there is a record that I've got out there, Impermanent Permanence, uh, all the way through it, it's got that kind of stuff where it's just splatting everywhere. And I looked at it at the time and was like, okay, that's all wrong. But every time I went to take it out, the sound just wasn't the same. So it's like, yeah, all those records I've got of Tangerine Dreams from the 70s and 80s, when I listen to them now, they're covered in distortion. So sometimes you just let go. But a limiter on a sound like this that's using a frequency scanner and highlighter, which is commonly called a flanger or a phaser, um, or a resonator, uh, either allow all the movement that's in it, so let it be as free as it can, and then just put something on the top of it, just a limiter to stop yourself from exploding your mix. Or compress the buggery out of it to sit it inside, because otherwise inside the mix, all that movement, Let's say we decided to have a nice acoustic guitar and we get a reasonably broad range of our sound of sound from our guitar and we then say, I'm gonna play this at the same time. <laughs> it's not gonna be a comfortable thing. So you then decide, okay, is it my acoustic guitar that wants air in it? In which case I squish my pad. Just squish it. Or do I want my pad to be dominant? In which case squish your acoustic guitar. So it just sits, kind of like you say, okay, I want my acoustic guitar to sit in the middle here. So I'll highlight those frequencies of it and I'll let the pad be dominant all around here. I might even just notch out a little bit of the pad to be dominant around it. These sorts of pad sounds where there's a lot going on, especially when they've got sweep effects, sound wonderful when you audition them, but you've got to make a real decision when they go in the mix as to what role are they playing? And that role can change. Like I might introduce a piece with this. And then later in the piece, But that bit later in the piece, you can hear there's a bit more happening and there are probably other things happening around it. At that point, it's probably going to be a bit squished. I'm just going to lop it. So we're reminding ourselves of how expansive it was by putting a version of it back in there. What else have we got? Not many more. That one isn't going to have much joy in a musical mix at all because it's relying on a lot of being out of tune. But it can lead the mix, even though it's a pad sound. Let's say in a film, something's happened and we're like, ooh. So, it's technically a pad sound, but I would probably use that more as a lead than much else. Same with that thing. That's, a, that's an ambient or an atmospheric sound unlikely to be used in the middle of a, of a melodic mix. Same with that, we've got to work out what we've got around that. The, the, the swip bit of it, where it's whip, 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 uh, could really get in the way if we've got musical stuff. Try it, see how you go. But you can always look at limiting those, either with compressors or simply finding which part of the, um, the sound is doing it. Okay, so it's number two. So we could well automate this. A 
and just fade it in and out as the needs of the mix want us to have that there or not there. So you can do. So you've got several things that are creating it, but don't feel like if you've got a pad sound like this that's got really interesting bits, that that's the only way it can be through the through the piece. Use your friend automation to find out what's making those interesting things and then modify them through the mix. So you can use the same sound for familiarity through great sections of your mix, but you can just pull in the interesting bits as you need them. That's classic melodic pad stuff, so we can use it as a lead. Probably more of a counter melody lead than our real sort of lead lead hook, but it can be work can work as a lead or it can work as this sort of thing. A really solid base around which we use our clarinets, oboes, strings, whatever, to create movement around this nice solid platform stage on which everything else happens. That's that's real classic pad. Big moving thing. This is great sort of pad stuff too. Doesn't sound super exciting on its own, but you let that carry your chords. Let's say you started out composing something on a piano and you've got the piano line and you go, <laughs> I just don't think I really want this to be a piano anymore. Then this sort of sound is probably the, one of the first types of sounds that you'd be looking to reach for. Tempting to say, oh, the piano is boring, but I need something that's all. But probably you're trying to apply yourself over the song. You're not the god of the song. The song is the god of you. Your job is to try and express it. The song is God. Your job is to try and express the song. You can't go too far wrong if you do it that way. So then you might then say, okay, I'll take my MIDI from my piano sound, I'll mute my piano sound, and I'll start out with a really simple pad like this. Obviously it's not going to be dealing with Chopin piano runs, including a minor second. But if you've got your piano playing block chords, you can take out those parts of the MIDI, mute your piano sound or, or lower it in the mix, and then try them with a sound like this. That'll give you an idea of where you need to go next. You might then say, that'd be great, but you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if it had this rhythmic clatter through it? In which case you can then start to program in your rhythmic clatter from wherever you get it from. So, not super exciting, but super useful. That's sort of in the drone territory and I was playing around with um, a bit crushing. It's really an atmospheric sound as far as I'm concerned. I don't see myself using that in the middle of a melodic section unless we've got something like, let's say for example, the Icarus story that I, that I did. You know, we've got Icarus flying around and and I'm then through the middle of that piece dealing with poor miserable Icarus as he has come to terms with the fact that he made a dick of himself. Um, so I might have something like this sitting in the background. as I'm playing my melodic sound over the top. That's kind of interesting there, and if I were using that as a melodic sound, I would probably... I would probably have another more obviously melodic sound working around that as well. 
that's covered a lot. I don't know whether I've got any more in here. Really nice pad. That's just really pure sound effect, but it happens to be pitched. Again, wonderful for atmospheric work. I find these sorts of sounds are best not used alone. So it's got that, but if I've got another sound, which is either a very simple sound or an interesting sound, or possibly even a sound effect, the way they move together, that's going to create magic. Back to where we started. So I've run through a whole lot of sounds, which I haven't really done in the others, but in this case, pads are so broad, they play a big role. And there are different types of pads there as well. Everything from what's essentially a sound effect, merging through atmospheric sounds, which are musical, but sound effecty, through to big complex sounds that you have to be careful how you put melody around them through to just really simple bread and butter sounds which are going to hold a mix together like a, an arrangement together more than a mix really is the right word hold an arrangement together as your things move around them your bass under here your melodies out here and your pads sitting in the middle and that's where those really simple sounds just are worth their weight in gold uh, because they help pull those two parts together in your arrangement, not your mix, your arrangement. Obviously you're gonna mix them and the way you mix them is dependent upon what the arrangement's making those sounds do, louder, softer, what have you. So different styles of pads should be composed for differently. To take any one of these sounds and exchange it for any other one of these sounds is potentially an unwise thing to do. It may work beautifully, but you're just hoping for a happy accident. Chances are it's not going to work. So think, what's the role of this sound? How am I going to use it? And then don't be afraid to get in there with your, uh, your equaliser. Low and high pass. to be really sculpting that sound so that it fits in your mix. Not to say so this sound sounds great, but it fits in your mix. A pad, remember, lives in the middle of a mix. It's not the mix on its own. Occasionally it can be, and that's okay. But at that point, it's stepping into a lead role or a polyphonic role. But when it's in playing a real pad role, look at what the rest of your mix around it is doing, boost it outside of that, cut it inside of that, and make it so that it's playing that supporting role. It's the world. So in Harry Potter, there's a lot of information, a lot of background. It's not lead. It may occasionally appear in the lead. Weasleys appear in the lead a little bit, but they're part of the background. Muggles in general are background, but sometimes you're reading the newspaper about what the muggles are up to because that's telling you something that's happening in the story. So remember your role, EQ and mix these sounds as that. Now, thank you very much for your time, especially for those of you who have gone all the way through with this, you know, being one of the five, six percent of people who commit to doing this properly. As I'm saying always, if you have questions, things that you want me to look at, please ask. Uh, I think probably the next video that I'm doing in this series and probably the last in this series is actually a request. Uh, and that is to look at the layering inside a synth sound. That one stopped me for a couple of seconds when I was asked. It's just like, mm -hmm. But you know, it actually turns out to be a really valid question and carries on nicely from where we've got to because we've built up all these different ideas. Now, in the next video, we can look at, well, how might we incorporate all of those ideas, not so much in a song mix, but in the mix of an individual sound to make it more of itself. We've covered some of those things already, but it will be an interesting thing to look at. Well, how do we mix sounds within themselves to create one layered sound? That's next time. Thanks very much.